it? No, we got confused with the time. We thought it was eight o'clock. Hold on, let me find my other team members. Gotcha. That's my bad. We probably should have put a note out. So remember, we only moved it to eight last week to accommodate um, Mark being on Clubhouse so that people wouldn't have to leave the Clubhouse. Mm -hmm. um, but moving forward, it will always be at this time at seven Eastern. So that's our bad. We should have communicated that a little bit better. I feel like we need some like elevator music or something. <laughs> really? Holy <laughs> time. I know, right? <laughs> Anybody else would have just played some music. I got some music. Hold on. Let me let me let me put some up. I don't know why I can't see you guys. What do you mean? I just see the meeting sentiment. Like, I just see the um, the meeting topic page, but I don't see anything else. Hmm. Hold on a it's second. Weird. It shows you, like, in the actual participant list, not, like, in the waiting room or anything. So I don't know what that's about. Ready to start, or how oh, much longer we wait? We still wait on more of the team people come. Uh, we're just waiting on Lori's team. Okay. Yeah. So they thought that we were uh starting at eight, like we did last week. Oh right, right, because of Mark's, yeah. Mark's impromptu clubhouses. <laughs> right. That's why he's like he picked the best times. <laughs> I know, I know. But we, we probably need to make a, a an announcement yeah. to let everybody know that this is the regular time, it's seven o'clock. But um, we can talk about, oh, I guess what was like any, do anybody have like any interesting news that they saw over the past week? We could just talk about something like that before we start. Yeah, we can talk about that. Mark is on Clubhouse again. Oh, <laughs> this is. I was thinking I don't want to take away from Lori's presentation. I think I have some news to. No, I mean we can we can talk about that while we're waiting though. Okay. Uh, Rather than uh, the Facebook news about the um, goggles was very was very interesting. <laughs> uh, did you see that Facebook is releasing their own goggles? To I feel like everybody has goggles now. <laughs> true, true. It does seem like it. Facebook, I feel like Facebook is really trying to come for Apple. I feel like there's like some really uh, tension between Facebook and Apple.
at least if they compete with each other, they can't uh, try to uh, come at them for antitrust laws because they're like, no, we got competition. Look, that's true. That's a, yeah, that's true. But how does that technology work? Just like in the sense of like, I thought Apple had all their stuff so patented to the point where even if Facebook did come up with an Apple Watch, it will only work on Droid phones or something like that. Will it be something that can even be compatible with an Apple product? And even if it was, I'm guarantee you, Apple will find a way to make it to where it can't be. No, Apple and is hella bougie. They don't let anything. Yeah, they're not about to let Facebook stuff. come with no watch and let people Bluetooth to their watch from no iPhone. That's true. You no, know Apple not gonna do that. Apple. And you Apple see how many people already are connected in the um, and the whole Apple Watch. I think what they say over like, it was millions of people reportedly are connected to Apple Watch. No, that ecosystem is 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 something. It's stupid. Serious. Yeah. So I don't. Mm, that's gonna be interesting. That's a serious <laughs> ecosystem for real. And they're trying to expand it too, to where like now it's gonna be they want to have your car, your health, your health care. Like it's gonna be they basically are want to be they want to basically be with you at every part of your day. Right. Yeah. Facebook doing too much. They're doing way too much. I was gonna buy Apple. <laughs> I told you it was like a relationship. Yeah. yeah. I mean that it is what it is, right? Yeah, I mean, Facebook is too, though. I think Facebook is trying to create their own little world, to be honest. They want to have their own little virtual world. They're going to have, it's going to be like their own neighborhoods in their own world. They want, they're going to have people like their own currency. Facebook is, that's what Facebook is going. They're trying to have their own biggest virtual world. Are we getting ready to start the presentation? That's what it looks like. Somebody's got the presentation all up. I know. Let me know something so I can start running my mouth and let you. Uh... No, you guys can keep talking. <laughs> Listening. <laughs> Y'all ready to go? Um, Rama, you here? Lee, you here? I'm Hello. here. We're ready. Hi, Rama. Hi, Rama and Lee. Hey, family. How we doing? Good. All right, so today we're gonna start with Market Sentiment Saturday. Our hot topics for today are gonna include the market recap, weekly earnings, word on the street, and just in case, hit or miss. Over to Lee, who's going to continue with the market index. Uh, thanks, Lord. Appreciate it. Uh, hey, family, hope y'all doing great this Saturday and good evening. Good evening. Uh, Cousin Lee here. I'll go over the market index. Uh, so sort of four major indices that we covered this week actually all hit new 52 week highs during the week. So the market's been pretty hot. Uh, we'll see the Dow Jones finished above 34, uh, 31.4, uh, you know, 27 above the previous day closing and 132 above uh, its previous five days. So about one percent. Mm -hmm. Uh, in the Dow, can you hear me? Yep, we can hear you. And if if anyone is not talking, can you guys make sure that you mute out if you're not talking? We can hear you. No, I just sent you Okay, I think that covered it. Uh, I'll, I'll run it back. So, so the Dow, as we see, well, actually, all the four major indices finished above. Uh, they all hit new 52 week highs this week. Uh, so the Dow, as we start with, was above 31.4, uh, 27 above its previous day, and 132 uh, above from, from the previous week. So about a 1% change. Uh, they were actually, uh, their top performers, believe it or not, were Intel, Goldman Sachs, Chevron, and Disney. And we, and we kind of saw what happened in Disney. All of them were at least 3.5% above uh, previous weeks. Uh, the S&P also new 52 week high, about 3,900. And you see 18 from the day before, 32 for the week, 1.23%. Uh, uh, the S&P actually had over 162 companies hit new 52 week highs this week. So they were screaming also. Uh, the NASDAQ 100, same thing, uh, 14,069 from the previous day, 174 over the week, about 1.73%. And we know what it is, you know, all chips, no dip. So if you were in a 
the 31 sips you were sipping all week. Just to name a few, we had applied materials, ASML, Fortinet for the new list, Synopsis, Zillow, Zscaler, SMH, I could go on, but you know, we're hitting it with NASDAQ this week. Uh, the Russell 2000 actually formed the other three indices with a 2.4% increase from, from the previous week, finishing uh, just above 2250. Uh, two, two points up from the previous day, 34 points up for the week. So yeah, the market's all green, money's flowing. So just be careful. All right, we'll go to the next. Uh, some of the economic indicators, as we know, the stock market is not the economy, right? So the stock market is doing really, really well, but that doesn't always directly translate to how the economy is doing. So if we look at the jolts or the job openings and labor turnover survey, uh, this sort of this, this number tells us how many actual uh, job openings there are for this previous uh, week, or in this case, monthly. So we've got 6.6 .6 million that are actual open position, open jobs that are out there. The consensus was it would be about 6.5 and the previous was 6.5 million. So there's uh, a little over 100,000 um, 100, jobs opened more than what the consensus was. So actually more vacancies, more job openings. Uh, so one of those key economic indicators to see that some of these positions aren't being filled, not enough qualified employees or more jobs are losing people in the market. So just another indication. Uh, the consumer price index excluding food and energy. So if we look at the CPI, it's sort of a, another a gauge as to uh, how the economy is doing based off of the price of goods and services. And in this case, it's excluding the food and energy space within those categories. Those, the food and energy tend to be a bit volatile so they can give you a skewed number. So the CPI excluding the food and energy gives you a better barometer. And in this case, what, what we see is that the number of 1.4 is less than what the consensus was. So the goods and services were 1.4% less than previous. They wanted to, they, they expected a consensus of about 1.5 and previous was 1.6. And how we say that this is worse than expected, when you see a number decreasing, it's, it's more of a def deflationary trend, uh, which is not what you would want to see in a, in a roaring economy. You want to see inflation, not deflation. So the actual number being 1.4 is a downward trend, which is what is worse uh, than what the consensus was and are also worse than what is expected. Uh, initial job claims, uh, job less claims, I'm sorry. So for unemployment, uh, we see about 793,000. Uh, they expected about 757. So it's worse than previously uh, previously claimed as well as worse than what the consensus was. So we've got more people uh, claiming unemployment insurance for job jobless claims, which is again, not a good thing. And the Michigan Consumer uh, Sentiment Index, how folks feel about the, you know, how consumers feel about the uh, economy in general, uh, 76 obviously worse than the consensus of 80 and worse than what it was previously at about 79%. So overall, the economy is not doing all that well relative to the stock market. As we take a look at the interest rates, uh, broken out the two year treasuries and the 10 year treasuries, and we can see from the chart on top, the two years have been taking a dip for quite some time, going back a couple of years at that top chart, but we could see over the last five days, it's actually increased uh, two basis points from 0 0.09 to 0 0.11. So although it's been trending down over the last couple of years, over the last week, it has trended up two basis points. All right, so we go to the next chart, we'll see the 10 year treasury um, constant maturity rate. That 10 year has, Similar trend as the two year, as you've seen over the last couple of years, it's trending down, but it also trended down over the last five days. It went down uh, basically three basis points from 1.19 to 1.16. So there is a slight tightening between the 10 year and the two year. And so when you start looking at that, you start to concern yourself with sort of that inverted curve uh, issue. We haven't gotten there yet. It hadn't tightened that much. We're only talking about a couple of basis points. But uh, that's just something to consider. You know, we're looking at recession or deflationary sort of economic indicators. All right, that fear and greed index. 
as we saw from you know 52 week highs in those four major indices the greed index is still pretty high sitting at 63 so people are still looking at the equities market in order to try to find those returns uh, so the market is still running, uh, running pretty high right now as far as greed. And as we take a look at the VIX, it's running at its lowest point that it has been in probably a, a year or so at below 20. Uh, so that's a super low VIX. Uh, volatility is not in the market right now, which kind of correlates with that greed number. Uh, one of the things to concern yourself with when the VIX is this low, right, that turnaround and with all the money in the market right now, where is it going to go for more returns? And particularly as you go into a three day weekend, such as what we're going where the market won't be open on Monday, I would anticipate there's going to be some volatility in the market come Tuesday. Uh, that's historical, not always accurate to the day, but uh, again, the VIX is at its lowest point that it's been in a year. So um, I wouldn't expect it to stay down that low, particularly going into a three-day weekend. And at this point, I will pass the mic over to Ron. Thanks, Lee. You're welcome. <laughs> All right, so let's see what we have. So just starting from right, left to right, um, we've got Alibaba, ticker symbol BABA, B-A-B-A, -A, Chinese multinational technology company specializing in e-commerce. Next, we've got Fortinet, ticker F-T-N-T, a uh, cybersecurity company based in Sunnyvale, California. Um, followed by XPO Logistics, ticker symbol XPO, Transportation and Contract Logistics Company, based in Greenwich, Connecticut. Um, we've got Disney, ticker symbol DIS. Of course, it's the mass media company um, based in California. And then finally, we have Datadog, ticker symbol DDOG. Um, they're a monitoring service um, based here in the United States. So um, when we're looking, when we're talking about the stock price movement after the earnings report, um, Alibaba's stock price um, stayed relatively flat prior to and after earnings. Um, that's something that I didn't expect. Um, it kind of stayed flat. It just went sideways. Um, Fortinet was the only company whose stock price um, is steadily rising since the announcement came out. Um, and I should mention that this is all pretty fresh. So um, Baba and Fortinet, those um, earnings reports came out last week. And then XPO, Disney, and Datadog, they, their earnings came out just this last couple of days, so like Thursday, Friday. So this is all just very new. Um, and as a matter of fact, XPO, Disney, and Datadog, their stock prices actually went down relative to their previous closes, but by less than 1%. So it's nothing really significant, but they did drop. So that's why those hours are pointing down. And as I mentioned, because these ending reports are so fresh, um, we don't really get to see a trend. Um, so that's pretty much that. And then all the companies, they beat their expectations for EPS. Um, however, Disney did the best compared to where sentiment was for the company. So Disney's um, expectation was about negative 41 cents and they actually came up at um, a positive 32 cents, which means they um, are up about 178%. Um, and then all companies on the slide have revenue in the billions, except for Datadog. Um, Datadog came in at about 177 million, so it's nothing to sneeze at. Um, and uh, we have Fortinet on the board with um, the highest revenue, I believe, with that 748 billion. Next slide, please. And then here we've just got some up other upcoming earnings. So all of these um, on the screen right now are um, from the season two picks. Um, and we've got a few earnings in the next two weeks or so for all of these companies that are coming up um, really soon. That's all I have for now. Hello? Oh, sorry about that. <laughs> um, so the hot topic for this week, well, I guess all of these are hot topics, but um, the word on the street this week for us is 
cryptocurrency. And I have to admit, I went down a rabbit hole trying to find information because as I was doing my research, there were so many more stories coming out. So I'm sure there's more stories than, than what we're going to talk about. But I just wanted to do a high level of some of the things um, that were in the news this week about cryptocurrency. And what I didn't know when I started this research was that cryptocurrency covers over 200 different types of coins, tokens, and various types of um, cashless um, um, coins or whatever they're calling it, tokens. So um, I'll start with some of the gainers this week that have, some of them have been in the news and others have not. Um, Ethereum is up this week. Um, Bitcoin Cash, Stellar, another one at XRP that I didn't list there, and Litcoin. Um, some of the losers were um, the Graph, which most of us probably haven't heard of it. It's a, a very new token, um, Filecoin and Quant. And I'll have um, some of the percentages later, but some of the new players that were in the news and everyone's probably excited because Tesla, MasterCard, um, the oldest bank in America apparently is BNY Mellon, who has decided to also participate in this Bitcoin drive. Um, Bitcoin is the biggest part of, or takes up the biggest portion of um, cryptocurrency, but it's also, you know, getting attention from lots of business owners and different, you know, we know Tesla, we know Apple and MasterCard. These are some of the ones that have been announced this week. But in the past, we've had other vendors and, and businesses interested in participating in this Bitcoin, I'll say, run, because now everybody's interested all of a sudden. I'm not sure what the exact catalyst was besides Tesla being involved, so now everybody's following suit. But Jack Dorsey, which is the CEO of Twitter, and Jay Z announced that they're going to also participate in this Twitter and the Bitcoin um, drive. Uh, one company that surprised me, I guess, apparently there's a spinoff company or group <laughs> for the, I don't know if you know WSB, everybody should probably know them, Wall Street Bets. They have a spinoff organization now that is now going to issue their own cryptocurrency. It's a token specifically for their platform so that their um, vendors and their participants, customers, members will be able to use the tokens to buy things on their website and also to promote various items on the website. So I thought that was interesting. Everybody's getting into business. Apparently it's popular to, you know, have a Bitcoin or some type of cryptocurrency. I'm not sure how all that is going to play out, but that's, you know, above my pay grade. <laughs> so um, some of the ones that I wanted to highlight were just basically the ones that we hear most often. This is a small graph of maybe the top 10, you know, cryptocurrencies that we know of. Again, there's over 200, which I had no idea that there was that many. And apparently every day someone's adding a new coin. Um, so uh, we can't see these numbers here. So I'll, I'll talk about some of the numbers later. You can go ahead to the next, to the next one here. So this was um, the biggest news this week was the fact that Bitcoin almost reached fifty thousand dollars. It got up to forty that forty eight thousand seven hundred and forty six. Um, probably um, the catalyst for that, you know, run up was the fact that you know Jack Dorsey and all of these other vendors, Tesla, are now deciding they're going to participate. But you know, it's been on a slight run for the the last few weeks. Um, Bitcoin has and it had reached higher highs week over week. It's actually not the largest run up for the week for the um, cryptocurrency space. It's actually the graph, which is a new coin. Again, it's up over 167% in the last seven days. So it actually surpassed what um, Bitcoin has done. But the other news about cryptocurrency was Dogecoin. So Dogecoin is the popular one that had been talked about. I'm not sure if Wall Street bets were the, the recent catalyst for the discussion around Dogecoin, but they were down 20% this week. So I'm not sure you know, what's going on with that one. But yeah, Bitcoin is actually only up about 16% over last week's numbers. But the, the biggest news around um, the cryptocurrency space that we really don't care about, honestly, is this graph cryptocurrency, which is some type of token that just initiated back in December, but it's up 167%. So um, 
So like I said, various companies and vendors and businesses are getting into the cryptocurrency space, mostly gravitating to Bitcoin, though. So, you know, some of these other players we know, Lithium or Litcoin, Ethereum, Stellar, we've heard those names before, but it's not, um, you know, the biggest name is certainly Bitcoin. And again, it's almost at 50,000. So they're expecting that to run up next week because they're expecting additional vendors to get on board and start to participate in this cryptocurrency space. So um, you can go ahead to the next slide, please. So some of the things that I mentioned, the um, big, the big week, um, Bitcoin was the big week, was the news for the week um, because it did have the run up. And again, the catalyst is because the rapper Jay-Z and Twitter's um, CEO, Jack Dorsey, um, decided they're going to participate. They've you know, put up, invested 500 Bitcoin, which equates to $23 million. Um, Tesla is also involved. They've, they've added about $1.5 billion themselves. And their, their plan, at least what they've announced and filed with the SEC, is that they're going to start to accept crypto, cryptocurrency as payment for their cars. So, you know, that's to be seen. I'm sure they have other ways of uh, other products that they can sell in the future, but that's what they, the filing for the SEC has stated that they're planning to accept it as payment for their, their cars and other products. And so then this Satoshi Street Bets, this is the company that's the spinoff of the Wall Street Bets. They're the ones who's actually, you know, the new, the new player in the market in terms of these tokens. Um, again, I'm not sure if it'll have any value in the streets. However, this is their plan. I guess they sit there in the news. Now this is a good time for them to launch their own cryptocurrency. And then the new player, like I said, GRT, it was up um, week over week, 167%. But in the last two days, it was up over 80%. So 24 hours at press time, it was at $2.43. I personally have not heard of this one before. So when I started digging around and all of the news articles that came out, like I said, as I was doing the um, putting the numbers together and different percentages, it showed all of these different news stories that kept you know, exposing new things that I didn't know. So it was actually helpful that Lori bullied me into participating today. But I appreciate her because she's always encouraging us to, you know, step forward and participate. The more we learn, the more we earn. So I'm grateful for her. So that's my part of the presentation. Just in case if you missed it, um, the items that we're going to cover today will include the items that you should pay attention to this week in college. I muted everyone. Lori, go ahead and unmute yourself again. Okay, uh, let me start all over again. Um, just in case, if you missed it, this week we had Biden who in, in the category of politics, he basically, um, everyone is waiting for Biden to pretty much disclose what's going to happen with the $2 trillion that he's going to pump into the economy. We know that within that money that he's going to put into the economy, a portion of it is going to go towards infrastructure. A large portion of it is going to go towards the COVID and the vaccine progress. And then we also have to pay attention to what's going to happen with GDP. Then that leads to the other key players during economics. So if you're watching the news or you see any reports where you see federal chair Jerome Powell Christine Lagarde from the European Central Bank, um, Janet Yellen, those are key players that you need to pay attention to what they're saying. As soon as they speak, it's like an indicator for the market. The market will not move. They'll probably stay on pause if they don't hear, if they don't hear what they're going to say. So for example, with Jerome Powell this week, everyone was watching to hear what he was going to say about raising interest rates. If you raise interest rates, then that means we have less dollars in our pocket. And when we have less dollars in our pocket, then that means you could, if you raise it too fast, you could potentially start 
to see a rise in inflation. Is inflation good for us? It's not. So basically, in his talk for this week, what he said was he doesn't want to see inflation go up. He's not touching the interest rates. He's leaving it as is. So the market saw that, you know, that was a positive sign, but then this report came out late during the week. So there wasn't that much movement or much time for, you know, the, the key players to do anything. But be on the lookout next week, you might see some reaction. All eyes basically are going to pay attention to Japan as well, because Japan is also a key player. And the, the Asian market right now is on vacation, but Japan is supposed to release their budget announcement of what they plan to do for 2021. Once they release their announcement, then you'll start to see Europe will start to release theirs. Um, and then um, we will start to release ours as well. In terms of business, we all know Tesla as a model for introducing disruption. So the major disruption that, that Tesla came out was with their announcement, which Lorraine also covered, was that now they're going to accept Bitcoin for anyone who wants to order Tesla. Once Elon cracked that door, then you saw PayPal came in and said, we accept Tesla. Then Square came in, we accept Tesla. Then MasterCard, we accept Tesla. Then Fidelity. Fidelity decided to open up a fund called the Fidelity Bitcoin Fund. So be on the lookout for that. After that, then you're going to start to see other institutions that are also going to take interest where they're going to start offering their customers incentives for them to go in and to also um, open up accounts that'll potentially um, start to, to enforce Bitcoin transactions. In the tech space, Twitter pretty much was hot this week. Why was it hot? It was because our good old boy Elon. Elon, every time he made a tweet, it, it stirred up the markets. Everybody was watching Elon. Elon is the hot guy that's on the block this year. Every time he made a tweet, Dogecoin would go up, Tesla would go down. Every time he made a tweet, people were watching to see what innovations or what, you know, what ideas that he was going to put out. But this week, it was all about crypto. Now, what? Why is that a concern? Because we we also see that his excessiveness of tweeting can also cause a stir for the SEC. We all know what happened with the tweets that occurred with GameStop, AMC, um, Robinhood, Reddit. Next week, pay attention to what's going on because in the markets, you're going to see that um, Robinhood is going to have to answer to what happened in the markets in regards to the manipulation of, of price when some of, the, some of the institutions started to short GameStop, ANC, and a bunch of other companies. Major miss. Basically what this graph is showing you is what happened over a span of a month. GameStop started at $19, and then by the time it was January 14, it went to $40. By the time it was January 25, um, we saw that there was a pump which pushed it up to $144. By the time we reached February 2nd, it went over $500 and then came back down to $225. Now, is there any justification? This company is not introducing anything new. They don't have new products that are coming out. So how can you go within a month from $19 to $500 and then to an evaluation of $225 in less than a month. What's causing it? No one knew. AMC was another one that was targeted that went from $2 to about $20 and then back down to $14. BlackBerry, another company, which we know there's not that many Blackberries that are on the market, went from $2 to $26 to $15. Another company that was on the hit list was Nokia. When was the last time you guys had a Nokia? It went from $4 to $7, was pumped at $7, and then it dropped 
to five dollars. Other things to look out for the weeks ahead. Asia was Asia's on their holiday and they're about to reopen. When they reopen, you're going to you're going to see an influx of extra cash that's going to come into the markets. You have Japan, Thailand, and Singapore, they're going to come out with their gross domestic product data, GDP. Pay attention to those numbers. Then you have Singapore, which is going to come out with their budget data. Australia mining data is going to come out, and that's going to be an indication of um, what resources were produced and if, you know, if there's any type of production that would be positive that can be implemented into the global markets. Then we have to pay attention to the World Health Organization. What are their plans in regards to how Europe um, dealt with the vaccine rollout and how will that affect the other countries that are surrounding worldwide? This week, we also have FOMC, which is on the minutes for the Federal Reserve. Then we also have, pay attention to those 13F filings. The 13F filings for, for the hedge funds for last quarter are being released this week. So you might find some interesting information on whale wisdom or any of the documents that'll show you what these hedge funds were doing last quarter. Other things to pay attention to, um, I spoke about this before, GameStop has a hearing. You'll start to hear if the SEC is going to decide to pump in regulations against pumping and dumping. And what are the regulations that they're going to step, put in the markets to move, moving forward that we may have to adhere to when, it, when it's, it's in regards to holding stock, play, um, pretty much investing in options, or any other derivatives for companies, or they may restrict um, margin or request that there's, there may be higher limits that may be required. But that's something to, to watch and see what's going to happen in the future. This week, we also have earning reports from Walmart, Royal Caribbean, and Norwegian Cruise Lines. Um, other things to pay attention to, we have your automakers who are coming out with their EV plans, pay attention to GM, Tesla, Floored, and Blink, Blink who's involved in the battery space. And this is our presentation. I have another screen that I wanted to share with you guys. I don't I know how to do that. Hold on, let me see if I can minimize to get out. Can you guys still see my screen? Yep, we can yeah. still see. Okay. This right here is a business cycle, the worldwide business cycle. Why this is important? Because it pretty much tells you, this, this is from Moody. What they do is they rate and they evaluate um, the different factors of risk. Um, as you can see, the yellow represents at risk. You have Canada at risk. You have the United States at risk. You have portions of Asia is at risk and then portions of South America is at risk. Then those that are expanding over here, I believe this is China, China's expanding. And then uh, who's in recession? Portions of Africa are in recession in the, in the Burgundy, the Burgundy red. Then the parts of the world that are recovering, you have portions of South America, you have Mexico, and then all the ones that are blue, Australia, are recovering. So the world is concerned about def deflation. They're concerned about inflation. They're concerned about a crash. They're concerned about the amount of money that's being pumped into the economy if it's going to be too fast. And they're also concerned about unemployment because they're not sure if the money that's going to be given back in the stimulus if people are going to take that money and pump it back into the economy, or if they're going to take that money and hide it under their mattress and not do anything with it. If they hide it under their mattress and not do anything with it, then that means you're not investing in the economy, which means you're not investing in government 
because we know that government holds a majority of the contracts at this moment. So if you're not investing in the government, then that means the government goes into the default. So if you pay attention to the chatter, the chatter is saying that if we have two quarters that go up until June, where we don't have production, we could potentially see a bearish market start to take place and that would not be good for us. Um, something else, where is he? Uh, in terms, one thing that the SEC wants to pay attention to and to stop, they're noticing that this major trend is taking place where hedge funds are starting to short a lot of stock. The stocks that were that were um, targets for GameStop, Dillard's, AMC, Virgin, FUBU, Bed Bath & Beyond, Legan, um, National Beverage Corp, Sun Power, and Tandra Outlets. But then there's more every day when you go into, into your platforms, you can see like these, these major block orders that come in. And these are companies that, you know, are on the brink of filing for bankruptcy. And if they don't have enough cash in reserve, those companies may not have enough cash to sustain, so to sustain the short, and they get short squeezed out of the market, which could potentially be a problem. Um, one thing that the SEC wants to do is that they want to regulate that this abuse is not going to take place because when it's not the retailers, it's the institutions that are doing this. And this is causing an imbalance in our GDP and it's causing an imbalance in our everyday stock prices. Because remember once what I said before was that in 2018, the major, the major market maker was the Fed. If you're messing with the big guy, the Fed, then that means the Fed's going to have problems. They're going to turn back and they're going to lash back. Now, this lash back could also push people to transfer their money from the market into crypto. Why? Because crypto is deregulated and you can't really, you can't really follow the transactions of what's going on. Now, we know there's a major player who opened up the door would be would he be held responsible if that were to take place we don't know why no we know is because he opened up the door but then everybody else is trying to squeeze in right right behind them so these are things that we need to pay attention to because if there's a crash if if bitcoin is being is being identified as the new gold we know that when there's times of trouble, people usually throw their money into gold and to precious metals in order to protect their capital. But now what we're seeing is that people are putting their money into bonds. And is that a good thing? We don't know. Because what do bonds hold? Bonds hold debt. So as you can see here, this is showing that the largest amount of debt that we have overall the United States has over $300 trillion, I believe, in debt. And every year it goes up and up and up and up depending on our expense. And COVID is the main factor which would determine how and when we're going to get out of debt. And we don't know when COVID is going to go away and disappear. So 63% of Americans believe it would take a year or longer for the US economy to fully recover. This is the best case scenario. The worst can, case scenario says that it can take five to seven years for COVID to disappear, but we have to be vigilant. We have to identify what companies we can pivot into and pay attention to what the big players are doing and pretty much look for those openings that you can get in and you can ride the wave, wave along with them. And that's our presentation. That's all that we have. Thank you for listening. Any questions? Thank you, Lori. That was amazing. Your whole team, thank you. Thank you, you guys did a great job. Thank you. Yeah, that was fire.
All right. I and love I, the global I, information, I, Lori. Global piece, yeah. Yes, that yeah, global was nice. Nice information. Thank nope. you. All right, so let's open it up for uh, the cousins to uh, ask any questions that you have, uh, make any comments or, or statements that you want to share. Uh, just we just ask you guys can unmute yourselves. Just you know, do so in a respectful, orderly manner. <laughs> Anybody? Okay, so part of this this whole thing is, is, is not just for people to come and, and give you guys presentations, but it's also for us to come together and, and have discussions about these things because we're not gonna get better unless we start having these conversations and really start digesting this information and thinking about what it actually means to us and how it impacts us. It's true, because um, what I'm noticing also, like, when I watch the news, like, I start to see the terms that, you know, that Mark tells us, like, I started to see pivot, and then I started to see, like, other other words that come on the screen, like, um, who was, I pointed it out this week, pivot was one that I saw, um, I don't remember exactly, but like when you're when you're listening to like a lot of these analysts, and then you listen to the quality of the um, the research that we we're doing at in our red team and our black team and our green teams, you can tell who's bluffing and who's not, because the cousins they go in deep in their research, and then when you're listening to the the analysts, you could tell if they're actually giving you. Um, um, something of value or if they're just filling the time on, on on the television wasting your time that's funny it's an excellent point uh gary um you can unmute yourself if you have something to add or if you have a question no i, ca I came in a little late how everybody doing but um i came in when you were talking about um blackberry and nokia and all those different companies like that but one of the things that I was looking at about um, BlackBerry, because we, everybody always says that when's the last time you've seen a BlackBerry handset, but have we looked at how they've been pivoting? Because I'm in the military and when you use their, when, and I use an Apple iPhone, but for my email, they use BlackBerry security for it. So that's one thing that they're doing. Then they're also pivoting into the autonomous cars. So have we looked at those things? Because we're saying that a company is no longer a company without looking at what they're doing now, because it's the reason that they're still around, even though they're not making cell phones, or they still are making cell phones, but nobody's using them as much no more. That's true. Um, I, I am familiar with uh, BlackBerry Works and all their uh, stuff that they're using for secure nets. Um, but as, as a consumer on that side, I can say that, you know, a lot of their stuff, they, they glitch a lot. They, their, 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 their performance isn't the best. So when, you know, I saw that BlackBerry was part of that, uh, that whole uh, stonk uh, attack, you know, people trying to run up their stock, um, I really didn't have a lot of confidence in it because even though they do have a lot of government contracts for, you know, secure, secure networks on, on telephones, um, specifically the iPhones and to get into secure servers, it's not the best. And they're actually up for review. Okay. Similar with Nokia too, Gary. Um... I, you know, I know they have tons of patents, you know, they're involved with 5G, but I think the statements made tonight were more so a reference to those just aren't the companies that can bring you the best investment when it comes to where to put your money, if that makes sense. Yeah, that makes sense. I'm definitely not investing in Nokia, so you ain't got to worry about that. <laughs> <laughs> um, I did have a question. You, you, you brought up, um, Lori, you, you were talking about uh, people were looking to move their monies into bonds. Um, could you could you enlighten a little bit more on that um, as to why that might not be a good thing? Um, well, it, that's because it carries debt. So let's say um, we know that a majority of the U.S. debt is um, it was purchased by international, let's say like by China. So if in case the United States defaulted on debt and you put your money into these bonds, because basically what the United States does is that they're buying out these companies that are failing. 
So like you have Boeing, you have maybe BlackBerry, you may have Nokia. They'll put in money in order to, to pump in the economy to keep these companies afloat until the point that they can pretty much um, get back get back on their feet and keep going. But if they can't and then they default, then that means the United States can't give you your money back because you basically loan the United States money, but those debts will never get repaid. And then if you have a situation where China bought out United States debt, what if the United States tells China, we're not paying you the debt, we're just going to cancel the debt? Who, who's going to be left holding the bag? Is it going to be the investor or is it going to be China? So it's pretty risky. So what's the upside to it then? Why would anybody do it? Um, people that usually hold like that, that put their money in bonds Either you're putting your money in bonds to hold long-term. That's not something that you would want to put in for a short-term unless if you're trading bonds on the future side. Because mm -hmm. on the future side, is different. But if you're holding the bond, they're expecting you to hold it for a minimum of, let's say, five years or 10 years before you're going to see payment. It's not something that's really liquid. But you get a better rate the longer you hold, right? Like the longer I hold, the more money I potentially can make essentially, right? Which is why you want to hold longer. Yes and no, but okay. I don't think bonds, bonds are not, they don't give you a return as high as equities. Equities, okay. of course, you're going to get a higher return on equities. It's just that the bond gives you that security, but with, with political, political situations that are going on worldwide, um, a lot of people are not relying on bonds because they, they would pour their money m mainly in, in gold or silver. We will see they'll put money in platinum and the major metals because they feel like those can hold value. So now you see Bitcoin is doing the same thing where Bitcoin is holding value instead of them putting the money in the treasury because a lot of people are skeptical. They don't know if the government is going to be able to pay them back. So what's your opinion on TBT, the pick that was just currently added? I have to do um, my due diligence on that. I haven't had a chance okay. to look at it yet. It's something to hold as a hedge. Mm. Okay. If I were to do That's it, right. I would hold it as a hedge against like my other equities that are that are in my account. It's like, for That's example, what I was thinking too, yeah. So you would basically play like a call on it for like three to six months out, basically like a put in a way, right? But it's just in a call form, essentially. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's what I was thinking too would be the best way to play that. Okay, thank you for, for your opinion. Appreciate that. The other thing you can do too, which I noticed, um, let's say if you have a stock that's going against you, mm -hmm. you could like on the option side, you could also purchase a stock and then you monitor the movement of the stock versus the movement of the option. And the stock is pretty much your hedge against the negative days. So you might see that your option is not moving and it's red, but at the same time, your stock is moving and that washes out you know, a portion of the negative, the negative value in your option. Okay, that makes sense. And if I can add to that, um sort of treasury or bond conversation. If you notice on that 10 year chart for the um, constant maturity uh, 10 year, uh, you've seen it dip sort of precipitously over the last few years. It's down to the 1.19 sort of basis points, which is not a lot of return for a 10 year hold on your money. I mean, you can get that in a, one of these online sort of banking accounts at 1%. So, so holding your money in a 10 year bond right now, is not gonna give you the return you're gonna find in many instruments. Um, and so what typically you would see is for folks run to that for defensive purposes when there's volatility in the market or they can't get returned somewhere else or they sense that there's going to be some downside in the market. So bonds have historically been sort of defensive, but as of right now, they've sort of been running in tandem with the market because we're in such a sort of interesting space. Bonds ran up at the same time equities were running up. So there wasn't really a defensive place to play. And because they're running so so short 
so small in their returns, especially on those 10 years, uh, they, there tend to not be a lot of activity in that space right now. So uh, it, it's one of those situations where uh, on the 10 year side, especially, uh, you would wait to see those returns come back before you would see a lot of flood back into the bonds market because you can get, as Laurie said, a lot more return in Bitcoin that's deregulated. So yeah, it, it's it's an interesting space in time that we're in as far as the market because it's not moving like it does historically. How do things work, Lee and Lori, I don't know if you know the answer, but like, how do things work when like companies like Tesla or Square, you go ahead and start investing um, into Bitcoin or into certain like asset classes before certain regulations come? Is it like a grandfathered in type of situation where he gets all the benefits from the, you know, a assets under management situation or how does that work? Mm -hmm. Or will the regulation automatically just kick in? Well, I think I think what they're going to do is they're going to put a pause and okay. then probably going to stop like transactions from going through. Because I know someone who who actually um, in Africa, they, they were using Bitcoin for a while and their government stopped like any type of crypto transactions from going. So they could put a pause and not allow for transactions, uh, transactions to go through until they see that um, they set their regulations in place. But if you have like big institutions are pouring in money at the same time, they'll introduce the right regulations a little bit at the time, but then what they'll do is they'll say, well, we have people that are already in this space that have been grandfathered in, but we're placing, um, we're, we're placing a majority of of uh, the responsibility for these institutions to monitor who's doing these transactions and you have to report back to us. If you see any illegal or any suspicious activity, you're responsible to cut off that activity and let us know so that we can take over and then issue fines or do whatever whatever regulations that we need to do in order to address, address that issue. But they'll allow, they'll give you enough of a rope for you to hang yourself and then when they see that you're pushing too far, then they're going to pull back that rope. So in other words, I just we just need to follow this and be careful because we don't know how this might affect our positions in Tesla, et cetera. Right. Yeah. Even Elon, he said he said, don't put all your money in in crypto. He said, if you're going to put your money in crypto, make sure it's not money that you're not afraid to lose. So he's very clear of the risk of the money that he's put in thus is basically what you're saying. Okay, interesting. The other issue that, that came out this week also, I don't know if Lorraine saw it, they were talking about um, even though blockchain is at a point where uh, you can't really... Um, follow the transactions, but, and people haven't found a way to hack the system, they're concerned about the wallets. So they can hack the wallets and then you may not be able to retrieve your funds. So they're trying to figure out like, what is the proper proper format or what is the proper um, housing material that would keep people from, from getting hacked and losing their life, life savings because, you know, the market yeah, I would say is still, is still early. I was going to say that hacking has been an issue for years. Um, they've encouraged people not to obviously leave your coins on platforms to help avoid hacking, um, to get like a personal wallet, like a nano wallet. I don't know if anyone's familiar with crypto, um, but you are able to track the transactions. Actually, you can see all of the movements, which is somewhat crazy. Um, from even like a retailer standpoint, you can track, let's say if you know your friend's uh, public wallet address, um, you're able to track every single transaction they've made and kind of follow where coins are going. For instance, I, a, I did some crypto a while ago, and um, I honestly have no idea how to get back into one of my wallets, but my friend confirmed that, you know, what my value is and like the last time a transaction happened 
on my wallet because he sent me something like almost two years ago. So, I mean, that part of it's really crazy that you can track all those transactions like that. I think I think we have one of our cousins. I don't know if he's on here. He said um, he used to mine mine Bitcoin. Is um, Wayne? Are you here? I guess he's not. He's not here. But he used to mine Bitcoin, and um, to the point where at I think he had a couple of big full coins. And he threw out his computer. So then now he's like kicking himself because he's trying to figure out, well, where can he go to find find his hard drive that had all those Bitcoins? Hey cousins, I'd just like to share. Um, I've been in that space since about like 2015. And like the thing of it is on the um, exchanges, they are not a bank. So it wouldn't be wise to keep your money on there because they have been hacked. Uh, you could just Google Mt. Gox. And um, what you can do is use Ledger or Treasure. They're like a um, USB military grade um, a password plus you'll, and you can transfer it to the USB where you can keep your crypto offline and bring it back online anytime you want and nobody can uh, hack it like that. And then if you deal with an exchange or a platform, even a wallet, when you establish that account, you would want to generate and you get personal keys, um, security keys. So even if you lost or misplaced your password, you can retrieve your account by using your personalized keys. Like the guy who lost that 22 million, whatever, lost his password. If he had retained his keys, he would still have his money. Even if you lost your hard drive or whatever, you could still go to the internet, log in, reach out to the platform, uh, verify with your keys and retrieve your money. But they also um, give you a hard time because you have to submit all types of documents to prove that the wallet is yours. Because yeah. I had I had a few in Binance and I lost my keys also. So um, yeah. they ask for like your birth certificate, your driver's license. They ask for all types of security information. Yeah, that all comes under the KYC. Yes, that is correct. But um, if you are interested in, in investing in crypto, like for me, what I plan to do is to invest in the technology that surrounds crypto that's going to offer the services. And that's a better play where you can probably look at um, some of the ETFs that, that, you know, that support the technology that offer, offer the wallets some of them that offer the ATMs because there are a lot of ATMs that are out there. You have Block, you have Coin, you have you have Riot. Um, some of the ETFs that are in fintech in the in the arcs. There there's a there's a wide variety of options that are coming out. And then you have Coinbase that's going to offer crypto. You have Cash App that's offering crypto when you buy purchases where they give you a percentage off of off of the debit card that they give you. You have Visa, you have MasterCard. I believe Amazon is coming out with their own version of crypto. And then you also have, uh, who else? A bunch, of, a bunch of companies are coming out and you will probably see more news coming out this month, well, which would introduce like different people that are introducing some form of Bitcoin or some form of the other, of the other derivatives. All right, Dope, does anybody else have anything they wanna add? All right, cool. Well, we, uh, we're just a little bit over the hour, which is fine. Uh, we definitely uh, don't wanna discourage anybody that wants to have open dialogue regarding today's topics. Um, we will be 
uh, doing this again next week. Uh, so if anybody wants to volunteer to sign up to present next week, definitely let us know. We'll be putting something out in the groups for you guys to sign up. If you have questions about how to get the information, how to do the research, we have a template available for you. And then we'll all, we'll, we are all also available to answer any questions that you have in terms of how to do your research or how to set that up. Um, anybody, if no one else has anything, then uh, AJ, Tayo, Renz, Mike, if you guys have anything you want to add, otherwise uh, we can go ahead and send everybody off to enjoy the rest of their Valentine weekend. No, I just appreciate uh, Lori and team. Um, and uh, yeah, that's it. Just want to encourage everybody to not be afraid and sign up. It's a learning experience for us all. So. Yeah, good wanna, job, team. I also want to thank um, uh, the team members, uh, Lorraine, Rama, Lee. Um, they all, you know, did their part. They did their due diligence and came out, you know, came out strong with their research. So I encourage them to come out and to do more. Yes, I thoroughly agree. Thank you guys for being willing to be. Thank you, guys. You guys did a great job. Oh, and, and thank you, Renzo, for, for helping with the supporting research and the slides as well. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Larry. Renzo.com. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Good job, Ryan. team. I just, I just wanted to make a mention that there was, um, I saw something pretty interesting about how there was, I don't know if it was mentioned earlier, I might have missed it, but the U.S. Uh, based stock funds attracted like 20 $22.9 billion, which was like the largest weekly inflow since like March 20, 2008. So, um, just something that I was uh, something to note that I, I noted when I was like in my research. So, just something to keep in mind. Yeah, that, uh, that Friday afternoon rally that you guys saw, where we kind of uh, started picking up steam after being red all day for the most part, I think that came from that influx of. Uh, of money into the market so we're probably going to see an influx on tuesday because they came out with um the senate's decision whether to impeach or not to impeach so we're going to see how the market is going to respond when they open uh -huh. all good things all right well uh once again guys thanks for coming out and, and again, we want to encourage you guys to, you know, participate, sign up, volunteer. This is how we take our research and our thinking to the next level so that we can take our investing to the next level and our gains to the next level, most importantly. Um, you guys have a wonderful evening. Enjoy the rest of your weekend. We'll see you guys next week. Later, family. Make sure you enjoy your loved ones. All right. Happy Valentine's Day. Good night, everyone. Good night.